Gentles and ladies, how are you today? I'm Spiro, and I'm not a wizard. I'm going to take it on a sidetrack today, away from the C64 videos that I would normally do, or I have normally done. Um, I am going to be getting back to the adventure writing game thing, but the last couple of days I've been playing around with Atari emulators, um, partly because uh, I bought an Atari 130XE uh, and trying to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, I've currently got uh, on the keyboard, the, the, the physical keyboard, um, half of the bottom row of keys uh, from the left shift through to the B are not working. Uh, and looking online it seems that the uh, the membranes behind the keyboards are commonly faulty um, due to age or whatever and uh, that can lead to some of the keys so I've ordered a um, uh, like a like a little pen thing that would will draw um, like it's got conductive ink inside it and so you can use that to redraw some of the traces if there are connections that aren't made um, so because of that I've been trying to learn more about the uh, the Ataris the 8-bit machines which I never really had much exposure to one of my friends had uh, an Atari I think he had an 800 and it might have been an XL uh, I'm not 100% sure because this is going back many, many, many years. Uh, and at about that time, I was I was heavily into the Amiga. Um, just well, just getting into the Amiga, um, and that was my first computer that I ever owned, but not the first computer I used. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I never really got much into the Ataris. Like I, I um, at college, aka you call it high school in America, um, the the computer lab that had just been set up uh, was basically all um, PCs. It was XTs. So, any of the stuff we were doing together tended to be on the PCs. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the I still don't know a lot about the Ataris. Um, I've I've set up an emulator here which is called Altera. Um, I will leave links to everything I mention here in the description box below. Um, but I thought I'd make this video as a noob um, to maybe encourage or entice people who might not have played with the Ataris um, to have a bit of a go with them and what I've learned getting them set up to have an assembler um, running and you know having a bit of a play with it so um, <clears throat> I've I've got Altera here. Which Oh, I'm booting it up into XE mode. Um what I'll do, so if I press F1, uh I thought I had set it up so that it would go to basic by default. Reboot. Maybe I broke with my settings. Anyway, this is. Let's pretend it's not working. Um, we'll press F1, and that will take us into the emulators configuration. Uh, there are shortcuts. If we press Alt D, that takes us to the disk management. If we press Alt C, that takes us to the cartridge management, um, and a few things like that. So. What I want to do, so what I found out was that there's this, uh, 
I, I actually have got a cartridge that I, I had a I had a 130 XE years ago and never got it working because I never had the video cable for it um, and just kind of put it on a shelf and kind of forgot about it. <coughs> um, in fact, I bought that Atari XE off the guy. There's a poster up there, which may not even be visible, from NZ Retro Magazine. They've just released issue one. Side note. Um, that just came in the mail today. Uh, and a friend of mine, Carl, is um, the writer, editor, publisher, everything for that. He did that magazine all on his own. And um, I met him through online uh, marketplace buying retro computers off him. And I actually bought my, my first 130XE off him. Um, so years went by, I sold all my retro computers and I bought another one. Um, I still had, I, I had, I had scored from somewhere uh, a cartridge for the Atari assembler editor and the manual. I don't know where the manual is, but I still have the cartridge. So I, I've been playing around with that on the physical machine. Um, but limited because some of the keys I need are some of the ones that don't work. But I got it on the emulator, started playing with it, then discovered that there was a, a, a better one or a more up-to-date one called Mac 65, um, which this has got version 1.01 .01 on the screen here, dated 1984, but there is a 1.02 release, which I think is dated 1988, maybe. Um and that's a better assembler and it's a it's a macro assembler so it adds a lot of features uh it's apparently a lot faster to assemble stuff than the old assembler editor um and so i've been playing around with that a little bit and and, and one of the interesting things about it is that uh the source code you write is tokenized like basic source code and you've got line numbers, uh, and I, I I haven't found a full screen uh, assembly editor on the Atari 8 bits. I'd love to know if there is one, um, but this is fine. This this works pretty well um, for what it is, and given that my needs are not great at the moment, um, so. I thought I'd run through a little thing here. I'm not going to run through setting up the uh, the emulator itself. I'm running on Linux. Most people are probably not. So um, the your you know your configuration screen. You might if you're running on Windows, you'll probably have little drop down menus. You can choose all these things, but the general functionality will be the same. Uh, and, and what I found was that this comes as a, a, a cartridge, and it comes as a disc as well. Um, but if you download this here, this there will contain a zip file that has uh, two ROM cartridge images, uh, versions 1.01 .01 and 1.02, uh, and disc versions, uh, and I think like an extras tool disc as well. Um, and there's the manual is here, which you can download um, for the 1.2 and the 1.0 and 1.1 if you want. Uh, actually, that says 1. Point, cartridge revision 1.2, yet the software is 1.02. I'm not sure what that's about. Anyway, um, so that's Mac 65. And when I put the cartridge in, I thought, you know, I'll be... Clever, I'll stick the cartridge in. Uh, run me our uh, bollocks. Let's go to. I don't know why it doesn't remember my. Oh, butt weasels. I don't know why it doesn't remember the folder. Okay, so let's go to Mac 65 1.02 ROM. Now, the thing about the emulators here is that if you see a file called .rom 
it is the raw ROM cartridge uh, data. If you have a file called CAR, uh, it is a, it is a emulator format cartridge, which is the ROM with a header so that it can identify what format the cartridge is because there were multiple cartridge formats, different sizes. Um, I haven't found a, a, a cartridge file of MAT65, only the ROM files. So, uh, and I, I don't have the page up now because it's on Atari Wiki, which for me fails several times a day. It's it's like random whether I'll leave a link to it in the description, um, and maybe it'll work for you when you look when you view this video. Um, uh, but it specifies what format this ROM image is. So if I go enter. Um, you've got a cartridge type to choose from and this one happens to be the OSS 2 chip 16 kilobyte with the 034M format. Not the 043 but the 034. So we'll select that. I'll press escape, escape and nothing happens. Why is nothing happening? I'm not sure why that's black. It should have come up with some kind of error. Maybe I'll retry. This is going to be a bit of a fail video. All right, let's try doing that again. Anyway, I, it, it doesn't work by default. Uh, workbench Atari. Oh, bollocks. Not the zip file. That one. That one. Boot. Okay. It doesn't work until you set up a bootable disk. Um, and so you've got to boot with a DOS disk. I actually, because I, when I was playing with the, the Atari assembler editor, I found I couldn't save to disk images. I could save to cassettes. Um because I hadn't booted up a DOS, it didn't have the DOS drivers. Um, a real weird thing about the Ataris. So I'm going to boot with a DOS XE 1.0 and the, there's a page here which I'll link to which has got all different versions of DOS. Um, so this is, a, there's an ATR file which is the Atari uh, disk image file and there's a manual here. Uh, you can choose any DOS you want. They do have different uh, driver versions. They do have different, um, you know, different releases. But this XE, because I'm booting the emulator into XE mode, I thought I'll use that. Um, so we've got a DOS disk loaded in the floppy drive, and we've got the cartridge loaded in the cartridge slot. And hopefully, if I hit Shift F5 to do a full reboot, I've still got nothing. Technical difficulties. Let me pause this video. Sigh. Turns out the ROM files were on my external hard drive, which I had to unplug so that I could plug in the microphone and the camera so re-downloaded here is the f here is the page where those roms come from again i'll leave that in the link below again but this won't be how to set up so we load that and we go into basic hello 20 go to 10 run Right, great. So let's get back to where we were. We want to load a cartridge. We're going to load the Mac 65 cartridge. Uh, OSS 2 chip 034M. Press escape. Oh, it does boot. 
Oh, I thought I had to have a. Oh, I've got to have a DOS disk in there, I think, so I can write. Nothing ever goes how I plan it because I don't plan it. As far as I know, to write to a disk, I need to have a DOS boot disk in place. I'm also going to load another disk which has got some source code on. Uh, I'm going to give that a reboot. Okay, so if I go DOS now, right, I can go File Access Menu. I can go Files Listing. Get rid of that. I put D2 because it's the second drive, which is my source code disk, and we've got our source code. <coughs> uh, I'm going to load the hello.asm. So I'll exit back to the cartridge. Right. So what we've seen here is we've got the cartridge for the uh, the assembler. We've got a DOS disk so that we can. So let me just do a little test while you're here. If I go to disks, I'll eject that. I'll eject that, and I'll do a reboot. Shift F5, boot error. That's what I was getting. That's what I thought it was. I don't know why the other one booted into. Interesting. So if I put the DOS boot disk in there, it comes up. That's what I thought had to happen. Again, I'm very new to Atari's. This is weird. I'll go back into the disk uh, manager. I'll put my source code disk in drive D2. So now we're in Mac 65. There's the edit screen here. Um, the, the manual is well recommended. Um, it does you do you do kind of need it to, to know how to to load and list. so we've got similar to basic we've got a list command um, we've got there's a um, to save stuff to disk you go list hash and then the file name blah right so pressing enter on that will save it to a file um, you could go list p colon if you've got a printer attached and it will send your listing to a printer um, for some reason e colon is the drive letter for the screen so list and list hash e colon are the same um, they display it to the screen. So if I went 10, oh, so we'll, let me, I'll also, okay, so to load a file, we go enter. So because we're saving it as, I believe it's non-tokenized source code. So if I do a list hash, um, D colon file name, it will save in what I believe is untokenized uh, file. So enter hash d2 hello.asm will load that untokenized source code into the edit buffer. Right? So we can see the disk flashing down the bottom. Now if I go to list. Alright, I'm just pausing the screen here. So this is the source code. So this source code I got from... Uh, there's, there's a YouTube 
channel called 8-Bit and More, and he is really heavily into Ataris. So I, he, um, I used his code, tiny bit modified, um, and that's what this is. Uh, so uh, just to show you list e colon we'll list it to the screen cool um, uh, the Ataris have got a feature like on on the Commodore 64s if you hold down control it will slow down the 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 display that's that's scrolling past the scrolling display uh, the Ataris have got uh, if you press control one uh, it's like a scroll lock button um, it, it'll it'll pause the the output and then you press control one again and it will unpause it so if I press list and go control one that's paused it so we'll see stuff that's very Similar, it's obviously a 6502 um, assembly language. Uh, the interesting thing about these assemblers is that uh, spacing matters. So th if they, they, they kind of treat the code as columns. So the first, the first column is your uh, line number. The second column, if you press, so you press one space uh, or tab. Uh, I actually use tab when I'm doing it because the code will go out a little bit further. But one space or one tab will take you into the second column, and that is the um, the label column. Then you press space or tab again, and that takes you into the mnemonic uh, or the instruction column I think in the other assembler you can press space or tab again and you can leave a comment without doing the semicolon um, personally my brain can't cope with that so I just put the semicolon in I'm not sure if in Mac 65 the semicolon is a necessity uh, I haven't looked into that but I, I always just put it in just for readability so I know so that there's a separation there okay so th this is the Atari is quite different to the C64 but there are some things that I can put down to sort of similar um, this source code I just increase the size so it's a bit more legible for you the, f the first thing that this code does we set up our our origin of uh, hex 4000 uh, this is a, an assembler pseudo co uh, pseudo op that uh, and the, uh, there are a few different ones you can put this is for when it's assembling uh, and the obj will mean that when it assembles it will also assemble into the memory location you've specified um, by default Mac 65 does not assemble into memory um, it basically does an assembly checks that everything is okay uh, and then relies on you to assemble it into memory manually later or you put that at the top this Mac 65's predecessor the assembly editor did assemble into memory by default anyway okay so now we set up a bunch of constants okay we set up the end of line is $9b um, open is uh, hex 03 write hex 08 put record which is what we're actually going to be using in this code is is hex 09 there's also a put character uh, hex ob now the the difference that i can put these down to is putting the record is like uh, on the c64 when you um, want to 
when you want to print something to the te to uh, some text to the screen, you can either use the kernel routine, uh, FFD2 in, in that case. Um, you 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 know you set up your um, your your registers with all the right data, then you then you JSR to FFD2, and if you've done everything right, the text you've set up, uh, your text buffer will be displayed on the screen. Um, that's kind of what I feel this put record is like. It, it basically just puts the the text buffer that you specify at the cursor position. Now I think this put character is um, more like on the C sixty four where you will put characters to a memory. You know, you you can you can put a character to a memory location on the C64 and that memory location happens to be screen memory. Um, again, because the Atari works a little different, that's not 100% accurate, but I think that that's a kind of general way of thinking of, of how, well, at least how I understand how these two work. This code just uses the put record. Um, the the Atari has got different graphic modes, so it does work quite a little, quite a lot differently. Um, there, it has the concept of we've got to open a screen, which you'll see down here, and then once we've set, once we've opened the screen, the 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 graphic mode or whatever you you know, um, whatever you want to call it, then we set it up to be written to, and then we put the record, and then we put the text buffer. Um, and then we call, uh, we you know, we put the message to the screen. So again, it's just putting it, the pointers in the right places. And then we we jump to a, a general uh, I.O. vector. And that I.O. vector will do what it has been instructed based on what you've told it to do up here. Um, so, you know, the first, the first, uh, the, the, the first thing we're going to do is uh, open the screen. So we're going to load the open um, token. Uh, we're going to set. We're going to store that into the command byte. So, so this. I, I, I'm not sure what this IOCB is. The uh, the input output uh, control buffer or I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Um, but basically, at, at each one of them, they, the, so number zero starts at hex 340, and each of them are hex 10, well, sorry, hex OF in length. So they are, um, if if we go to three five zero, that's IOCB number one. Three uh, six zero is IOCB number two, and we're actually going to be going to the second IOCB. So we're going to be adding an offset of hex two zero. So when we store it, it'll be at that offset. So it'll be at so 340 is number 0, 350 is number 1, 360 will be at number 2, and that's what we're and that's what we're writing into. I know I'm not explaining a lot of this very well. Um, but again, hopefully this will be a an incentive to to get you to start looking into into it. So the general IO vector that was called later is at uh, hex E456. So that will be a kernel routine that that calls, that is called, that that will do what we ask. We've got here device name, byte E colon. So as we saw with me listing our output to E colon, it goes to the screen. So we're basically our we will be outputting to the screen so 
we could use this exact same code to output to a printer by changing that to p colon. Um, I guess we could also write it to a disk by putting d colon and then some file name. Um, now we've got the the text string that we're going to be outputting, and then the code actually starts. So in my version, it's, it's, so it's an interesting thing here the way this. Not just not just how eight bit more does his code, but how I've seen code from other places, either in in, in manuals or whatever, that start at at an origin location, have data, and then start the code, and then they jump. Then they've got to to know where their their um, their actual code starts in memory and then they jump to that using their debugger which seems odd to me so I if you look at line 25 here I've just got a jump start and I've changed this open SCR label to be start so first thing it does is it jumps to that location and then starts executing but the assembler has already set this stuff up and will create these links in memory. So then we can go to the debugger and just uh, go to memory address for, uh, hex 4000 and it'll just run the code and we won't have to know where we're pointing to. Um, so as you can see line 220 has got start. Sorry I can't point to it because this emulator eats my mouse pointer. Um, so, the first thing we're doing is loading X with that second IOCB offset. Uh, then we're loading the A register with the open uh, token. We're storing that in the command uh, buffer with our, with our offset. Uh, then we're loading the device name so the so that because it's a text string is going to be uh, a 16 bit value so we split the low byte and the high byte um, on c64 uh, the, the way I do it I don't know if it's the only way to do it but we would do like load uh, LDA uh, hash dev name uh, less than and that'll be and then a location and that'll be the low byte and then we'd go um, LDA uh, hash dev name greater than and then that will be the high byte or do I have that upside down anyway so we so it's a little bit different where this doesn't and 255 to get the low byte um, and then you divide that by 256 to chop off whatever was, um, whatever it doesn't need for the high byte, and then store that in the high byte. Um, now, so that was, uh, oh, let's go to here because I can show you my mouse. The so, I don't know why that description is there because that effectively is setting the screen up for the right. That, well that sets the screen up now we set it up for write operation okay um, th there are these so the other th the other things that we need to know about is there's a buffer address there's a buffer length low and high bytes and there's an auxiliary which I I haven't read a good description of what that auxiliary is from what I've seen anyone writing stuff to the screen like this we'll only use auxiliary one and they will use that to store the write token into. So as you can see, we've got uh, we're storing write into auxiliary one. And for these purposes, auxiliary two isn't used but needs to be clear. So that gets loaded with zero zero. And then we call the IO vector. So what that does 
is that that blocker code has opened up the screen and set it up for a write operation. So it's basically said, I'm now ready to receive, uh, like I'm, I'm in a mode that I can display the text for you. Um, so the next thing, we load the text buffers low and high byte. Um, and that goes into the, that is the buffer address low and high byte. So we store the address for it here. And then we print the message to the screen. So this is the buffer length, the BL, low and high bytes. Um, where did we do the record? Oh, we I missed a bit up here. So we, we, we set it up to do a put record. So that is going to the, the text, and that goes into the command. Uh, memory location. So the command is put record. The the low and high bytes go into the buffer address, and then the buffer length get put into the the BLL low and high bytes. Um, so now there's this bit of code here, which is loading FF into uh, hex 2fc. Now hex 2fc is is a kernel memory address that stores any key presses into it. So if there's no key being pressed, that will have a value of ff. Uh, so we've initialized it as ff. Um, now we go into the display loop so the first thing we do is we call the io vector so this prints the message to the screen the first time all right then we load the 2fc we compare it to ff so we're saying has a key been pressed if it's not equal in other words, if it's not equal to FF, so a key has not been pressed, we branch to quit. Otherwise, we jump to loop, which calls that routine again, and these values are still in place. Um, and 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 those, you know, these uh, have not been changed, so it'll print again. Uh, now, one thing I did do was another change I made was down the end because the way that loop is the checking seems backwards to me um, uh, you know like checking for a negative so what I've done is I've said compare um, the key press to FF branch if equal to loop right so if it is still received nothing loop again in other words, when it doesn't, when it when it does receive a key press, it will just fall out of that loop and it will go to quit. Um, that just seems a little bit tidier. So we've got our source code. We can use the uh, ASM command, and that will assemble it into memory. Uh, we hit that, so I'm just going to pause it every now and then, so you can see the output is showing us uh, values, 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 and then once we start getting into code, you can see where things are starting to store uh, on the on the far left. It's probably that side on you. Um, We've got the memory addresses of 4003, 4006, 4000A, 400E. So now we're looking at where it's assembling it into memory. Uh, it keeps on going. It keeps on going. Page 2. It's designed for output to a printer. Um, so here we go. We've gotten to the end. I've, I've, still, I've paused it. 
and you can see assembly errors zero uh, mount of memory free and then it gives you a symbol table at the end right so we can actually look at um, where we've got quit 4057 uh, is the end of our code so if we wanted to write this out as an object file to disk we would use hex 4000 to hex 4057 um, and in fact we can do that by b save for a binary save d2 colon we'll call it hello dot exe uh, I'm still not entirely sure how to execute stuff from basic I'll figure that out another day uh, and then we use a uh, less than and the memory locations we don't even it, it knows that they're hex value so we don't need to put the dollar sign um, and so our our quit is at four zero five seven right so we've now it's written that to disk so if I go to DOS I'll do file access menu file listing of D2 I'll do H star dot star so we've got here oh I haven't actually set that 20 SE88 is actually time stamping so I haven't reset this because it's an emulator it gets wiped uh, so it's actually saying it's 20th September 1988 um, hello ASM is our source code uh, hello was a previous one that I saved and the hello.exe is the one I've just saved now um, so source code is 1302 bytes the uh, the assembled object code is 94 bytes so press return escape from main menu e to exit back to cartridge and we're back here so we've got our code right we're still got our code now mac 65 has a debugger called ddt for reasons if you know what ddt is is it kills bugs um, this is quite different to well pretty much any other debugger I've used on an 8-bit machine um, it puts us into this interface so the cursor is underneath where it says enter command uh, it's put us at BEFC um, we can press asterisk we don't need to press the space after it and then go 4000 because that's where our assembled code is and we press enter now we see that's where our code is because the first command is jump 4013 and that was the jump command that we put in uh, we can go control arrow keys and that will take us down so if we go to 4013 we'll see that LDX uh, 20 well, hex 20 is the first command the first instruction of our code um, and then we can keep on going down until we receive a the break which is at 4057 and that's the end of our code so to run it we can use g for go 4000 and that will <coughs> excuse me that will start executing from address hex 4000 um, and then we can see it's now printing hello world Add infinitum until we press a key. I want to press I. And that's it. If we set our so the asterisk sets our um, program counter 
and the Atari, if you press the start button, which on this emulator is F4, uh, there is a start button on the physical keyboards. <coughs> if you press F4, it will start executing from wherever the program counter is set. So I can, using the arrow keys, I can move it around, but the program counter... Actually, I'm not going to say that because I'm not 100% sure. Let's find out. You ready for a crash? This doesn't work. I'm hoping that by pressing start, it'll treat the 4000 as the start location. Yes. Whew. Okay. And if I was to go start now, nothing would happen because the, the PC counter is at the end and it'll be break. And there you go, nothing happened. Because it went straight back into the debugger. Uh, so yeah, we can press Q. And that will take us back into the uh, assembler. Um, this does have a couple of other features. So we can list 10, 50. So start and end of range um, what else can we do that's interesting um, we can renumber everything let's, let's do a list because I think there might be a couple of lines missing so 620 is the last line if I go renumber It'll automatically do it to 10. So there we go. There was one line I did delete. And I think it was that. Uh, had in, having to do with those loops. That I changed at the end of the code. Um, yeah. That's kind of it. Like there's. There's. Some interesting things to play with. Um, the reference menu. Which I'll load here. Um. Revision 1.2. That's interesting. Ding, 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 ding. Um, so yeah, this gives you, you know, the obvious assembler um, <coughs> manual. It has all the... Oh, there's a text mode as well. That's an interesting... I haven't used that, but there's... So edit mode is the tokenized code... Uh, format and text mode lets you create standard text files apparently um, and or and I think that those are so maybe those are the ones that are saved on discs as a non-tokenized format oh I've got a cat hello is it dinner time hello dinner time for the cats okay Cat is fed. Um, yeah, this video is nearly an hour long. And I think I've rambled on enough. Um, but hopefully that piques your interest enough to keep playing with Atari 8-bit machines. Um, yeah, kind of interesting. One, one of the really interesting things I found about it is uh, there's a thing called Sparta DOS X, which is basically like MS DOS for Atari 8 bit machines. It is amazing. Like, I mean, it is so advanced for something, for machines that are so basic, um, that I find it incredible. Um, it's, yep. Yeah. Uh, there's still a lot for me to learn, obviously. There's um, the things like disk formats are incompatible. Like when I created a disk here using this uh, XE DOS, uh, I tried to mount that disk when I had booted into Sparta DOS and it couldn't read it. Um, so I, th I think that there is a... Um, 
there, there must be a way to read those discs through Sparta DOS, but I think you've got to add device drivers. Like it was hilarious, you know, when I first loaded it and and started reading the manual. Um, and Sparta DOS actually has a really good manual, in that um, it is being updated. Even, well, I won't say like I think it's that it was last updated a year ago or something like that, um, or recently. And the the manual goes through step by step, teaching you how to um, how how to how to use it, uh, and in such a way that uh, it must have come from the eighties, and it 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 doesn't assume you know how to use MS DOS. Um, or any DOS on PCs, it, it kind of starts, you know, it, it, it's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. It's, um, and, and I just found it quite incredible how advanced it was. Uh, yeah, that's me. I think I'm going to finish up this video. Thanks for watching. Um, I will be getting back to the... Uh, Adventure Writers Gamebook for the C64 very soon. Um, but I thought maybe you'd find this interesting. Hopefully you liked it. Tell me what you think. Leave comments below. Um, tell me where I have can improve, where, I've, where I was wrong. As I said, I'm a noob to the Ataris. Um, so if you know Ataris and can offer some help, some insight, um, some pointers, uh, I would very much welcome them. And... Uh, We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.